This is the GCSE and A-Level Physics live stream. This is a Sunday night edition. Uh, I'm expecting that you probably didn't do too much work Friday, Saturday night, but now it's a case of, uh, you know, the Antiques Roadshow is on. There's that uh, theme tune that comes on that kind of puts fear into your hearts because, you know, it's school again uh, first thing tomorrow. Um, so we're going to be doing GCSE between now and about 8 o'clock. And then from 8 till about half 8, we're going to be doing some A-Level. Um, there's obviously uh, the chat that you can, uh, if you're watching this live, you can put your questions, you can kind of comment on things. I do try and read it. Unfortunately, I don't always get to read out everybody's comments and sometimes I make a right hash of saying your username. So I do apologise about that. Um, but yeah, so um, I've got a good question here and I think this is really suitable for GCSE and A-level. Uh, there's two to three weeks left for GCSE. Would I recommend making flashcards now or using pre-made and past papers? I would say you need to make your own flashcards. Don't use the pre-made ones because that doesn't really teach you much. It's the actual act of making the flashcard which is going to help you learn something. So you don't have to just get pre-made -pre ones, just make them yourself. Uh, use them in conjunction with past papers. And as you're doing that past paper, and then you mark your past paper, there'll be certain things where you think, oh, I didn't know that definition, or that's a really important thing, or I maybe made a mistake there. And you can still make flashcards as you're marking the past papers. And that means that your past papers inform what's, go what's actually going on to those flashcards. Uh, and then so you can keep adding to them and then keep reviewing it. So don't think it's like you do your flashcards, then you do your past papers. You can be doing both at the same time. And those flashcards can be like the maybe the top five easy mistakes that you made on that paper. Um, right, uh, we've got another question uh, from Howling Wu. Howling Roof, Howling Wolf uh, 989, is it better to focus on practice questions and papers rather than going through topics or even go through past paper revised topics that you're struggling on? Um, I think a bit of both. I mean, it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I would say at this point, though, rather than going through topic by topic, personally, I would be looking at uh, practice papers and past papers. Uh, obviously, I've got um, practice papers I'm trying to sell uh, for GCSE, so I've got 12 of these. Uh, but there are lots of past papers available. And by doing the past papers, that'll I allow you to identify the topics you're not so confident on. And then you can go back and spend maybe an evening or something just looking at the topics that you're not familiar with, then go back to more past papers and so on. Okay, um, so yeah, basically, um, we're going to be doing uh, a load of stuff tonight. If I just show you where you can find the information, if you go to uh, gcsephysicsonline.com, my website, there's a bit at the side that says live. If you click on that, um, you can then find kind of the dates coming up for what's going to be happening. Um, so tonight it's the 21st. So if you just click on the 21st, it takes you down to this bit here. So we're going to be doing some questions. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, a practical about density that I sh I'm sure all of you will have done or all of you should definitely know about. And then also some uh, calculations about electricity. And then tomorrow we're going to be doing uh, black bodies, uh, and that's to do with infrared radiation and EM uh, radiation and also refraction of light. Um, and then you can see kind of what we're doing for the rest of the week. So this is the plan for the next five live streams from today up until Thursday. Um, so uh, is this the one with the Eureka can? This one isn't actually using that Eureka can. Um, and sometimes, so yeah, there's, there's different ways of doing it. Now, one way of doing the density practical is you have a can like this. Uh, you fill it full of water, and then when the water gets to the spout, it tips out. And what you can do is put another measuring cylinder just down here. And when you put your object in, this is going to displace an equal volume of water to the volume of whatever this object is. Uh, and then we can measure that off. Now. Uh, sometimes this is called a Eureka can. Oh. Sometimes it's also called uh, a displacement can. I'm sure there's probably some other names for it. Um, and this is a great way of measuring an irregular object. Okay, but there are other ways of doing it. And this is just one method. And this is the thing with physics. There's not just one perfect approach. And often the questions that you might find in an exam, they talk about an imperfect method, so there's something for you to discuss and maybe look at the limitations of that. Um, so let's have a look at the question from tonight. So this one here is a question from, uh, sorry, let me just have a look. So today, 
This is the question from paper 1H Alpha. So this is one of my practice papers, obviously you can download it. Uh, and if you do download it, you also get the mark scheme and model solutions and video answers if you've got a premium plan. Um, so here's a question. Uh, and of course, if you want to sort of play along at home, uh, we've got a teacher performing a demonstration to determine the density of the following objects. So we've just got um, these things here. Uh, they're all cubes, so that's important. Uh, and I would say that, you know, things like that, the word cube, that just means we know the volume is going to be equal to the length of one of those sides cubed. OK, you know that from GCSE maths. OK, um, the, the teacher measured the mass um, once and we've got these values here. The first thing we want to do is state. So there's no calculations needed. We just need to put down that number. OK, so it's not calculate. We need to kind of write down a formula. This is just stating a number and it's the resolution of the mass balance used to measure the mass of each cube. So, um, yeah, so uh, Catherine, uh, if it measures to the nearest 0.1 gram, is that what resolution means? Yes, it does. Nathan as well also got the answer of 0 0.1. So the resolution of that is 0 0.1 grams, okay? And to get the mark, what you need to have is not just the number of 0 0.1, but also the unit it's measuring as well. So 0 0.1 grams is the correct answer for that. And that's because we can measure to the nearest 0 0.1 of a gram. Okay, um, right, I've just seen a good question here. How would you recommend revising the day before and the day of the examination? Uh, any tips for nervousness? Uh, Rahik, yeah, uh, being nervous is absolutely fine. That's normal. Um, and there's a, there's a, I suppose, this is the thing, like having an exam, it is nerve wracking. And there's a difference between sort of being a bit nervous and that's normal, you get like a heightened sense of adrenaline and that kind of really focuses your mind. But there's also like the anxiety, which can then mean that you're not thinking clearly. So I think the best thing you can do to stop being nervous is to try and do as much preparation in advance as possible. So you're not panicking knowing that you've not had enough time to prepare. And on the day of the exam, basically what you're doing is I would say, do the easier stuff. You don't want to be doing the hardest questions which you're really struggling with. I would say on, you know, maybe even if you're doing a higher tier paper, maybe just look through a foundation tier paper and go, yeah, I know that, I know that, I know that. And maybe just you need something to boost your confidence rather than doing anything which is too hard. Uh, also, a uh, big shout out to Arkwells. Um, great name uh, for the donation. I really appreciate that. I think I can actually, yeah, there we go. I think I can um, put like a, a nice heart there. So yeah, thank you so much. Right, uh, so this one here, the answer is 0 0.1 of a gram. That's a resolution because it measures to the nearest 0 0.1 of a gram. Okay, um, can I do A-level maths videos? I'm afraid not. Uh, I've got, I mean, I will be doing lots of A-level maths content within the A-level physics videos I do for mate, but I'm afraid I don't do A-level maths. Bison maths, so go and watch Bison maths. He is awesome, really nice guy. Uh, so A-level maths, he's brilliant. Okay, um, explain why it'd be better to take repeat readings for the maths. So what we want to do is rather than just measuring something once, we want to do repeat readings. Why is that? Well, if this is just basically good science. So if at some point, um, this isn't a prediction, but I do kind of predict there will be a question where you need to write down the word repeat in one of your exams. Okay, um, why is that? Well, basically, um, this allows you to spot... And this is a word that I always spell wrong. Anomalies, okay? Anomalies, okay. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, this allows you to spot anomalies because you can see if there's one result which is far out uh, from all the others. Um, and that means um, that basically... Uh, the mean can be calculated. Um, you could just say the average, but in physics, we always just tend to use the mean. Although you need to understand the mode and the median, it's the mean value that we want. And of course, if you're going to calculate the mean, you would um, get rid of the anomalous result. Um, the mean can be calculated um, and a more, I suppose, accurate value obtained. 
Okay, so all things there which all of you know about, and it's just a case of writing them down. So spot anomalies uh, allows a mean to be calculated, and that's going to make your result more accurate. Uh, and also, I guess it's going to help increase the reliability of that. Um, right. Okay, do I know who Mr. Barry is? Um, Syrupy Gaming, uh, I don't know the name, but I might have met him before. But obviously, if he's a big fan, that's amazing. So a big shout out. We'll maybe dedicate this to Mr. Barry. Um, that'd be great. Uh, Arkweld, what do I get for A-level maths? Yeah, so I really like maths at school. Um, and I got an A when I did A-level maths. But in the olden days when I did it, I did it in the year 2000, which makes me seem ancient. Uh, and they basically went from A down to E. There wasn't an A star. So... Uh, I got an A grade at maths because uh, I really quite liked it. Okay, um, right, the next question then. So this is a question about something that you might not have used, okay? You don't have to know how to use this at GCSE. Normally when you're measuring the diameters or the length or the, or the, the width of objects, um, you use a ruler, okay? That's what all of you know about. But it says here the teacher measures the width of each cube using a pair of digital calipers. Uh, the resolution of the calipers is 0 0.1 millimetres. Um, state and explain how using a pair of digital calipers to make this measurement rather than the ruler would affect the accuracy of the measurement. Okay, so maybe this is our cube uh, that we're measuring. Um, I can't remember where I got these from, but they're, they're lovely, aren't they? Okay, so we've got a cube. We've used a caliper. Um, now, it says here this has got a resolution of 0 0.1 millimetre. If instead we look at a normal ruler, a ruler has a resolution of basically plus or minus one millimeter. Okay, so what we can say is by using um, a better or more suitable instrument, we can get a more accurate reading. So basically, uh, we could say, and this is kind of stating the obvious things, uh, the digital calipers, and sometimes the word caliper is spelt with one L, sometimes it's spelt with two Ls, uh, the digital calipers have a higher resolution um, and then I'm going to quote some numbers of 0 0.1 millimetres rather than one millimetre for a ruler um, so the final reading is more accurate. And I think what I've seen a lot of the time is that students write down the correct answer, but they don't always quote numbers, okay? And um, what you need to do is sometimes quote numbers. And it might be that you're comparing some data in a graph, you're looking at maybe how one thing compares to another. If they've given you numbers in the question, it's often useful to, you know, use these numbers later on in your answer, okay? So a lot of this uh, sounds, um, sounds really, really kind of like obvious, but like when you're writing answers like this, make sure that you quote numbers. Okay, um, right, so the teacher records the width of cube D is 41 millimetres. Uh, calculate the density of cube D, giving your answers in kilograms per cubic metres. Okay, so, uh, good question. Um, right, first of all, to work out the density, because we're going we're gonna to work out the density, which is the symbol rho, we've got the width, I'm going to call that W, uh, and we need to know the mass, which has been given to us in another part of the question. So, uh, like Catherine said, what's the mass? Well, it's going to be given to us somewhere, and it's going to be QD, and therefore we've got this mass over here. So, the thing I'm going to do, I'll write that down again. Uh, I'm going to write down the equation that says density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. And the mass is 186.1, which is 0 0.1861 kilograms. Okay, because we want to give our answer in kilograms per cubic metre. Okay, uh, the next thing then is we need to know the volume. And the volume is going to be equal to the width or the length, doesn't really matter which word we use, I'm going to call that W uh, cubed. Okay, now it's 41 millimetres, so that's 0 0.0410 of a metre, and that's going to be cubed. Okay, uh, Mr. TT or Mrs. Uh, T, no, it's Mr, isn't it? 
TTV, Mr. Pickle. Uh, appreciate the donation. Thank you so much. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I can... Can I like that? That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, took on my pickle. Right, okay, yeah. So, um, right, so we know this. So that's the mass in kilograms. We've got the width or the length in metres. Um, so if we just work that out, so 0 0.041... Uh, cubed, uh, and then we've got 0.1861 divided by the answer, giving an answer answer of 2,700. Okay, uh, so the density is 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so um, is this so this answer here? It's a big number because what we're doing, we've got a small number divided by a really, really small number, which gives us a big number, okay? Now, that's about right, because if you, again, this is the kind of thing that uh, you often need to do. You need to look at your answers and think, does that make sense? Is it like a, a reasonable number? Now, for this, if you imagine having a metre by a metre by a metre, so imagine standing next to something which is a metre long and a metre high, and like your kind of this height. I don't know how tall you are, but that's basically you. Okay, um, if you have something like this, is it going to be heavy? Yes. Is it going to be about 2,700 kilograms? Well, yes, it is. Okay, uh, that's going to be the kind of the approximate density of something which is quite big. Okay, there we go. That was it. So this question was about the density of a regular object, which can be found not necessarily using a Eureka can or a displacement can, but by using the dimensions of the object. And it kind of really tried... The reason I did this question was to reinforce the idea that there are certain shapes that you need to know the volume of. And one of those is a cube, but of course you need to know like the, the volume of a cuboid as well. So that's just kind of using maths. Okay, um, right. Okay, so that one there, nice GCSE question to begin with. Right, so the next question, which is GCSE, and then we're going to be going on to A-level. I think it says down here somewhere, uh, I think it says... This side, yeah, I think this side uh, it says we're doing A level from eight o'clock. Um, right, so let's see. Um, a thermistor is an example of a device whose resistance depends on external conditions. In the case of the thermistor, the resistance depends on the temperature of the component. Okay, so this question is um, basically about one of these. Okay, now I'm sure all of you are imagining the circuit symbol. This is a thermistor, which is a thermal resistor, which is something that changes resistance depending on the temperature. Now, the first question, it says, uh, use the axis in figure eight, or the axes, label the x-axis and add a line to show how the resistance in ohms depends on the temperature of the component in degrees Celsius. So, uh, we've got along here, we've got temperature. So that's going to be the quantity and the units are degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's basically one mark already for just doing that. Okay, um, so that's your first mark. The second thing is you just need to sketch the shape. Now we don't need any values, but the kind of shape we get is a curve that looks a bit like that. Okay, uh, so what we have is something where as something gets hotter and hotter, the resistance decreases. Okay, now I'm sure, of course, I'm sure all of you know that. Uh, this is kind of the opposite to what happens to maybe a piece of wire. If you have a piece of wire and you heat it up, the resistance would increase. But here we have something where when you heat it up, you're basically giving that material energy that releases extra kind of electrons inside the material. So it means that the resistance decreases because there are more electrons available to, to carry that charge. Okay, so um, I would say what you have is a curved line. And if you've got this curved line, uh, it's kind of steeper and then it gets shallower, that's going to be giving you the mark. Okay, um, right. We then have a question or a, a kind of a, a setup of a circuit here. Um, a diode is an example of a component whose resistance can also vary. Uh, a diode is placed in a circuit with a variable resistor, an ammeter, uh, a voltmeter, a switch, and a resistor. And the correct circuit, someone to show how the voltmeter should be added into the circuit to measure the potential difference across the diode. Um, so, this one over here 
is um, a question which is, again, I think going to come up in your GCSE exams. There will be, my prediction, there'll be some question about where an ammeter goes in a circuit and where a voltmeter goes. Now, the voltmeter always goes uh, in parallel, as Zruxi says. Um, in parallel, arc weld, yeah, across a diode. So we basically have the voltmeter there. And the thing is, we only put the voltmeter across the component that we're actually investigating. Okay, so that one over there is an easy mark. You just need to remember the circuit symbol for a voltmeter, and it only goes across this. Now, the reason that we have this kind of circuit is because with a variable resistor, we can change the overall resistance of that circuit, and that's going to change how much current is flowing through it, and that's going to change the reading on the ammeter. Um, it's also going to change the reading on the voltmeter, so we can get values for I and values for V. The reason we have the resistor is to um, reduce the overall current, because if you have a diode in that circuit without a resistor, then there's a danger that you get a really high current flowing when this has got a low resistance, and that could then basically burn the component and it starts smoking. Um, good question. Would you get the mark if you say voltage instead of PD? Yes, you would. I reckon it, uh, because lots of textbooks, lots of videos still refer to it as voltage. Uh, and I think some exam boards, I think, um, I think WJC in Wales, I think some of the edxcel IGCSE, I think they use the word voltage rather than potential difference. Uh, but yeah, basically, potential difference is absolutely fine. Voltage is fine as well. Okay, was there an ad break? Has there just been an ad break? I think that's just YouTube doing its thing to, to get money coming in. Okay. Right, uh, the next question is um, the circuit is set up with the variable resistor adjusted. Uh, so the ammeter reads a non-zero value. What would happen in the circuit when the diode is reversed? Okay, um, so... Yeah, okay, I think I think YouTube is giving ads at certain points in the video. I think it just realizes when it's popular. Um, so yes, yeah, so for this question, so this is what the question says. State and explain what will happen in the circuit when the diode is reversed. Okay, so basically, um, when the diode is reversed, And here's the thing, what I want you to do is don't say it. Because you might have said when it's reversed, but the it is a bit unspecific, so it's really good to be really specific with your language and talk about the exact component. So when the diode is reversed, it has a high resistance. So no current will flow and then you could also say things like the ammeter reads 0.0, .0 amps um, yeah so uh, I think that's basically it um, so what will happen that we kind of stated it that uh, no current will flow is a statement um, explain why that is because the diode when it's reversed it has a high resistance so basically, no, no current's going to flow. Um, okay, what causes the high resistance? Okay, this is a really good question uh, from Esgi uh, Cariel. And I, I think it's kind of beyond the scope of GCSE, and to be honest, it's even beyond the scope of A-level. But what you have with a diode is a semiconductor and that really only allows current to go in one direction, but not the other. But I don't have a very good explanation. What I will do, though, is tomorrow in the GCSE live stream, the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to explain the, re the, the reason that a diode only lets current go in one direction. OK, um, so there. But don't use the word it. So don't say when it's reversed. Say which component is reversed. Be really specific. Um, okay, before the diode was reversed, the ammeter read 2.4 amps. The voltmeter 
red four, calculate the energy transferred to the diode in four minutes. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to think about, you know, what equations can we use? So the energy transferred, so we want to know E, we've been given the time T. Okay, so what's the link? Well, the energy transferred is equal to the power multiplied by the time. Do we know the power? Uh, well, we know the current. I'm just going to put I here, and we've got that potential difference of 4.0. So we know I and V, uh, and therefore we know that P equals VI. Okay, uh, just be careful. Anybody typing stuff in, we've already got some good answers, which is brilliant. Um, make sure that you're using either a capital or a lowercase. In this, energy is capital, power is a capital, T is lowercase. Um, and basically, we, if we work out V times I, we get P. So we can substitute this into there to say that the energy transferred is going to be equal to the power, which is VI, multiplied by the time. Okay, so what I'd say is... Um, Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. Uh, if you if you do stuff bad stuff in the chat, you get banned. Okay. Um, right. So the answer is going to be uh, four point zero, which is a potential difference. The current is two point four, and the time is four minutes. But that's 4.0 minutes times 60 seconds. Okay, so um, so just to work this out, we've got 4 times 2.4 times 4 times 60, which is equal to 2304. Now, um, I would say, uh, yeah, Catherine, you got the right answer. Brilliant, well done. Um, I would say that the best way to write this down is to write down the, the value from your calculator here and then in the answer line maybe write down the number ml that's maybe to a more appropriate and significant figures. So I would say this is about 2,300 joules. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, I uh, Is that Ardil? Um, the 60 came from the fact that this was in minutes and what we need to do is we need to get the time in seconds. So we always convert to our standard units of seconds. Um, okay. Uh, explain whether a diode is an ohmic or non-ohmic conductor. Okay, so what do we mean by this? Well, things which are ohmic conductors, there's um, they basically obey Ohm's law that says the current is directly proportional to the potential difference at the same temperature. Um, if you don't round, do you get the mark, Joshua? Good question. I would say at GCSE, unless it says in the question, give your answer to two significant figures, then you'd get the full marks if you put 2304. So this will get you full marks. Uh, that's a better way in terms of the pure physics to do that. Okay, but you will get the marks unless it says, give your answer to two significant figures. Okay, so um, is a diode an ohmic or non-ohmic conductor? Uh, we can say that the diode is a non-ohmic conductor. And the reason for that, um, as the current is not directly proportional uh, to the potential difference as its resistance changes. There we go. Actually, that's quite a lot to write for one mark, isn't it? So uh, I suppose probably I should have really given that as two marks. Um, where do you download the papers for free? Uh, Super Gaming. Good question. What you can do is uh, if you want to see uh, the papers then um, basically at GCSE Physics Online, where it says practice papers, go there. And what you'll find is there's information about it. And then you can download um, down here, like the sample paper. Uh, and that means it gives you loads of kind of questions and stuff like that. You can also 
uh, in the video explanations tab if you wanted to see the full video explanations to that. Um, again, this is on the practice paper page. If you scroll down, it's got review your answers. And if you click on this one here, you can see my full video work solutions. You can basically skip to the question that you want. So I think this is question eight. Uh, and then basically what there will be is this is me in the past, common internet. Um, basically this is me going through that question uh, so that if you have the paper, uh, starts with a graph for a thermistor, so this is you can kind of see me doing this like a couple of weeks ago. But of course, uh, it's not that much money and it does keep supporting the, the live streams. Did I make these papers? Yes, I did. Uh, I did them with some other teachers. Uh, a lot of them were kind of uh, other examiners, people who mark exam papers. Some of them uh, have like worked for AQA in the past and basically they helped come up with some of the questions and I formatted them and Rufus, who works with me, he helped format it and Joe checked all the answers. Joe checked, works with me as well. And we basically made this full set of 12 papers. Okay, and yes, it's taken me ages. It's taken me about six months to make them. Anyway, um, it is now on to the A-level part of the stream. So uh, thank you so much for all of the, the GCSE lot. If you're A-level, let me know in the chat. Uh, if you are here for the A-level part of it, let me just organize myself. We're gonna be doing some stuff tonight on um, the young modulus. Okay, so this is something uh, that I think is a nice experiment to do. It's often uh, one of the kind of required practicals or things that you have to do for one of your PAGs. Um, yeah, so uh, we've got loads of people in. Uh, some people saying bye, so uh, bye to Josh, bye to um, so many people there. And then now on to A-level. So, right, Joe Smith, your exam your school changed to OCR. Yeah, I know a lot of school have changed away from AQA and have gone to OCR. So my hair just seems to be sticking up a bit of an angle. There you go, it is what it is. Okay, so, um, but the stuff we're doing tonight is gonna to be suitable for anybody doing OCR, AQA, Edexcel, CIE, whatever exam board you're doing, this is gonna be useful to you, okay? Now, the questions tonight, and actually, um, the, the kind of stuff we're doing um, is based on a load of questions from th these books that I've got, uh, so it's A-level. If you go to my alevelphysicsonline.com, if you go to the live section up here, it brings up this page here, and this means you can see what we're doing each day this week. Okay, so it's the 21st tonight. Uh, tonight we're gonna be doing some stuff about uncertainty in Young's modulus. We're then going to be looking at radioactive decay and natural logs tomorrow. A uh, bit of uh, line of best fit and G by the trapdoor method. So this is going to be a revision for anybody in year 13 and probably hopefully for people in year 12 as well. A bit more stuff about radioactive decay on Wednesday. And then Thursday, this is the plan. I mean, I'm in, in London on Thursday at a uh, um, uh, physics Olympiad kind of prize giving thing. But hopefully my train gets back in time. Then on Thursday, we're going to be doing G on a slope and also measuring G with an interrupt card. So a lot of this is revising uh, the skills that you need, including lots of stuff that comes up in sort of paper three for doing AQA. Um, yeah, so we're gonna be doing stuff tonight from uh, the Daily Workout book three. Of course, if you go to the website, you can download just the questions. So if you just click on download now, you will find the questions that you can work through yourself. And obviously we're gonna be going through the answers. And there's information in this book as well about some of the apparatus. So for a lot of you out there, um, I suspect that when you did Young's Modulus, that the standard setup is you do it in school with a long piece of copper wire that goes horizontally along the bench. And you basically, uh, you kind of put some masses that overhang a pulley at the edge. And what you'll see is a very, very tiny change in length. Okay, so the extension is going to be quite small. The alternative method that some schools have in terms of the equipment is something that hangs up from the ceiling and basically you've got two long wires and what you do is you basically, uh, there's this kind of thing here that can move this kind of uh, sales apparatus as it's called and as you wait this one here, this wire gets longer than this one and then it kind of moves down and you can detect a very, very small change. So that's the equipment setup, but a lot of stuff we're going to be looking at today 
is about uncertainties. Okay, so this is the stuff that I know people really dislike. Right, the first thing we're going to do is calculate the average diameter. So the average is just these numbers added up. Um, so we've got uh, 0.37 plus 0.38 plus 0.38 plus 0.36. Uh, we divide that by 4 uh, and here the answer so let's see the diameter the the mean value of diameter is equal to 0 0.3725 uh, and to give this as my final answer the average diameter I'm going to give it to the same number of significant figures which is 0 0.37 millimeters okay so that's my first answer and of course if you're uh, watching this at home you can uh, if you're watching this live uh, put your answers in if you want to but I've given I've worked it out I've written down my worked out answer and then I've written it down again to an appropriate number of significant figures we then want to look at its absolute uncertainty now the absolute uncertainty is not the percentage uncertainty. The absolute uncertainty has a unit. Okay, and here it's going to be equal to half the range because we have multiple readings. That absolute uncertainty is going to be equal to half the range. And that's equal to the highest 0 0.38 take away the lowest 0 0.36 uh, divide that by 2 and that's just 0 0.02 by 2 which equals 0 0.01 okay and because it's the absolute uncertainty which is important this also must have a, have a unit which in this case is a millimeter okay so that is the first question now this is the stuff that people find really difficult. Uh, and it's basically just the way that we do things. Um, so 0 0.37 millimetres, uh, 0 0.01 millimetre uncertainty. Uh, by the way, thank you for everybody in the chat at the moment who's uh, liking the video. Uh, if you haven't really done so, make sure, sure that you do like the stream. Uh, and if you want to put stuff in the chat, I will, um, I will kind of sort of read it as much as I can. Uh, James says that they wish they did OCR to look at the rise and fall of the clockwork universe. Um, just because you're not doing it doesn't mean that you can't study it. So, for example, if you did want to learn about relativity, uh, which I know is one of the kind of topics they do in OCRB, then um, you can learn it. Just because it's not in your exams doesn't mean that you can't learn that stuff. So, for example, if you wanted to do like the turning points module from AQA, or some extra astronomy and space stuff from AQA, just because it's not in your course doesn't mean that you can't look at that information. I would, of course, suggest doing that after your exams. Why is it divided by two? Uh, good question, Nick. Uh, basically, um, when you look at the absolute uncertainty in a reading, it's going to be equal to half the range. So the range is the biggest minus the smallest, and then I divide it by two because it's just half of that. Um, how do I get my calculator to show multiple answers at once? I think I did this question last week. Um, it's to do with if you go to shift setup and then if you put for input output so just click on one it's one of these but I can't remember which one so just go through your calculator and just go through these in order and it will give you that setup okay but I can't remember which one those but it's basically input and output I think I, I need to make some more calculator videos calculate the percentage uncertainty in the diameter right so there's no shorthand way of writing this but I'm just going to say that the percentage uncertainty in the diameter, because we've got multiple values, is going to be equal to um, the absolute uncertainty divided by the mean value, which in this case is the absolute uncertainty of 0 0.01 divided by the mean value, and here I'm going to use my unrounded down number, 0 0.3725, which is 0 0.0268. Oh, sorry, also we need to multiply this by 100 to get it as a percentage. 
and this is equal to 2.6846. So that's equal, and I'm going to give my going to give my answer to two significant figures. Uh, so that's 2.7 percent. Okay, uh, and I think that there's still like some debate about should that be one significant figure or two. Uh, I'm going to give it to two because we might need to use that later. Um, right. Cool. Uh, Joe says, um, enjoy particle physics. Yeah, I think that's quite definitely an inter interesting topic. I think particle physics is so different to GCSE. I say that this is different to GCSE. It's not as interesting, but it's just something you've got to learn. Um, do I know the Young's modulus of a Lego brick? No, I don't, but that's a very good question. It's almost like I need to build a big Lego structure and just stretch it and see what happens. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's a good that's a good point. Okay, uh, suggest a piece of equipment that could have recorded these measurements. So, let's see what people put in the chat. What equipment would you have used to make the measurements here for the diameter? So let's see what people say. What would you use at school? Uh, I would say the thing that you don't want to be using is something like a ruler, um, because with this you can only really measure the nearest millimeter. Um, Micrometer, screw gauge, micrometer, yeah, micrometer, yeah. This is all good, yeah. Uh, vernier calipers, yeah, I think that would do it as well. Uh, but basically, you just need to be aware of what it could be. So uh, you could just put micrometer. Uh, the screw gauge is kind of one that you kind of tighten at the end and then it kind of just, yeah, it tightens. So micrometer is absolutely fine. Digital caliper, uh, yeah, Jamie, perfect. Vernier calipers, yeah, Joe. All of these things are great things because what these can do is these can often measure to plus or minus 0 0.01 of a millimeter, or maybe even 0 0.1 of a millimeter. Okay, depending on the kind of piece of equipment. Right, um, describe how these measurements of the diameter are taken to improve accuracy. So, the way that these are taken, and this is something that I've seen come up loads of times, you know, how do you measure that diameter of a piece of wire? What you do is uh, you repeat at different points, and in different directions. Um, to check it's circular. So for example, if you had this wire here, you might take a reading here, you might take another reading kind of down here, a bit lower down in like a different orientation, maybe take another reading up here, and you should find that all the numbers are going to be fairly similar, which means it's actually a circular wire. If you had a cross section, which was a bit more like this, uh, and you took that diameter in different directions, you'd find that the numbers are different and therefore we couldn't use the equation uh, pi r squared to actually work out the radius. Um, okay, why different directions? Yeah, Isaac, it's just to make sure that it is circular. Okay, um, and that means that we can then use the equation that says the area is equal to pi r squared, or the area is equal to pi d squared over four. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So, right, if a meter ruler has the smallest division of 0.1 centimeter, should we first divide it by two? Uh, right, so, uh, Lazy Ass uh, is asking about a meter ruler. Basically, with a meter ruler, if you take one reading, the absolute uncertainty is going to be equal to that kind of resolution of that instrument. So, yeah, if you're me measuring one thing with a meter ruler, the absolute uncertainty is one millimeter. If you're taking repeat readings, the absolute uncertainty is equal to half the range. Okay. Um, uh, Scripting ones, would uniform be a good word to use or is that extra? Um, yeah, I reckon you could talk about, yeah, to check it's uh, to check it circular, to check it's uniform, I think they're both fine. Okay, calculate the cross-sectional area with its uncertainty. So here I'm going to use the equation that says A is equal to pi d squared over four. So um, what we'll do is we're gonna do this in square meters may as well. So that's equal to a pi times the diameter it says up here, 0 
and that's times 10 to the minus 3. So that's going to be squared. Divide that by 4. And if we do that, uh, so we've got 0 0.3725, so it's 10 to the minus 3 squared times pi divided by 4 is equal to 1.08979 times 10 to the minus 7. Again, I'm just going to always write this down uh, so that we have this number for any subsequent calculations. Um, so that's equal to 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 square metres. Okay, that's what we expect, because don't forget a piece of wire is very small, and if we think about how that cross-sectional area compares to what a metre by a metre is, it's going to be like a ten millionth of it. So yeah. Um, right, so the next one then uh, is uncertainty. Now the uncertainty, because what we have is the uncertainty in the area is going to be equal to pi d squared over 4. So this is, because there's no uncertainty in pi, there's no uncertainty in 4. The uncertainty in the area is going to be 2 times the percentage uncertainty in the diameter. Okay, now the percentage uncertainty in the diameter is 2.7%, and therefore the percentage uncertainty in A is 2 times 2.7%, which is 5.4%. Okay, so because we've got the diameter multiplied by the diameter, that percentage error in the diameter is doubled to look at the percentage uncertainty in the area. Hopefully that's making sense. Um, and therefore we want to work out 5.4% of, of this. So we're going to take the previous answer, multiply it by 0 0.54, and that's equal to 5.9 times 10 to the minus 9 metres squared. Okay, so basically... The cross-sectional area is this number, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7. And this number down here is going to be the uncertainty. And it doesn't say percentage uncertainty. It tells us, it asks us the uncertainty, and therefore it must have units. Okay, um, right. Uh, Mads is doing it at Excel, IAL. Um, just a question on extension in general. For a greater extension, the length must be higher, yep, and the diameter must be smaller, right? Yep, that's perfectly correct. Generally, if you had something twice as long, for the same force being applied, you'd have twice the extension. And if you have something where you've got a thinner diameter, uh, there's going to be a greater stress acting over that smaller surface area, and therefore that force is going to have uh, a bigger uh, stress, and therefore it will cause a greater extension as well. Um, when do we add the uncertainties and when do we multiply them, uh, Luca? You never multiply them. You only ever add them together, I think. Yes, all we're doing is every time you have an uncertainty in this, you just add it. Okay. Um, if you had an uncertainty divided by another uncertainty, would you minus the percentages or then convert to absolute? Ollie, uh, if you have a, an uncertainty divided by an uncertainty, you just add them all together. Okay. Um, actually, let me just find something. So I've got some stuff here where I've written it all down about uncertainties. So I've got some... Sorry, bear with me for a sec. Here we go. Right. This is how you combine uncertainties. Um, this is from the book two of my daily workout series. Um, so we've got... if you're looking at something at A is equal to B times C, then you just add them together. If um, um, A equals B, C, D, then you just add them all together. If you divide them, you add. If you're squaring, then you multiply by 2. If you're cubing, you multiply by 3. If you're square rooting, then you halve the uncertainty. Okay, so that's kind of like the, the one that makes it smaller. So, um, yeah, basically, if you're square rooting something, that's when you half the uncertainty, because we're basically saying... A is equal to B to the half. Okay, hopefully that helps. Um, so what we did there is we added um, the percentage uncertainties in the first part here. So we know the percentage uncertainty in the diameter. We then 
doubled that percentage of uncertainty to look at the total uncertainty, the combined uncertainty in that final answer. Hopefully that's helping. If you're really not sure and you're year 12, then obviously I've got this book here, but I also have videos over on um, A-level physics online. So for example, if you're doing AQA, uh, all you need to do is go to measurements and their errors. And then I have something here about um, uncertainty. So you can just find this section here. And then within that page, I've got questions about absolute uncertainty, percentage uncertainty, and so on. So all of these videos, some of you might have seen these beforehand. Uh, if, you're, if, if you've got Uplearn, you'll see the videos as well, because Uplearn are using these. Uh, but yeah, basically, hopefully that helps. You can always find everything you need at A-level physics online. Right, so that's the first part. Second part says, uh, a graph of load against extension is drawn using the recorded data and shows a directly proportional relationship. We then have some information about the Young's modulus. We've got the length, and we want to calculate the expected extension for a 10 kilogram mass hung on the wire. So I would say with this, um, that we've got lots of information. So let's write down what we know. The Young modulus is steel. So E is Young modulus. That's equal to 210 times 10 to the 9 pascals. Okay, we've got the initial length of the wire. So L was equal to 2.00 meters. Um, we've got a 10 kilogram mass. Okay, so the force being applied is equal to the weight of that, which is equal to mg. And then we've got 10, sorry, 10.0 uh, 10 times 9.81 is 98.1 newtons okay we know that the area of that wire a is equal to the answer that we calculated previously uh, i'm going to use this value here of 1.08979 so the area is 1.08979 times 10 to the minus 7 square meters and we don't know the extension okay i'm going to use e for extension uh, sometimes we use X, sometimes we use delta L. There are loads of things to use, but I'm just going to use this. So, uh, what equation, um, and I, I can see this is going to, and bearing in mind, we're going to use capital E for the young modulus, we're going to use little e for the extension. What equation would we use to work out the extension in terms of E, L, F, and A? Okay, so if you want to, in the chat, write what the, the equation is. I'm going to kind of do a bit of work just to the side. Um, so we've got somebody saying flea, which is good. Uh, Matthew, uh, Brennan, yep, yeah, that's great. Uh, we've got uh, is that Olivia, Olivia, Olivia uh, stress over strain. That's getting there. Uh, I would say I'm going to start with the young modulus is equal to stress over strain, which is equal to the force over which is equal to the force over area divided by the extension over the original length, which equals FL over EA. Okay, so um, I can see somebody else saying flax, scar face, excellent. So the extension, uh, the real uh, Joe Linton, not quite. Got to think about your uh, capital letters. If we basically bring this E up to here and that E down there, we can say the extension is equal to F. L over E A. Okay, so um, we've got uh, Shahid, um, Shahad Barak FX over AE, perfect. Uh, yeah, I think all of this, um, yeah, I did I did some stuff in COVID as well. So I, I just tend to use flea. So uh, young modulus is flea. Uh, so that's the way I can remember it. Um, and by the way, I'm sure there's lots of other international students, but I think a lot of people are from the UK. Actually, in the chat, uh, just let me know which city or which country you're from. So it'd be great to find out. I know there's probably lots of people from the UK uh, and England in, in particular. But if you're international, I think somebody Kate was in Pakistan earlier from what I saw in the chat. Um, somebody's just up for my live at 2am in the morning. Get to bed. Right. Manchester. Very nice. Going to Manchester next weekend. Nepal. Awesome. Very good. Derbyshire, Newcastle. Uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, South, South End, London, London. Um, people from India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Basingstoke. 
Basingstoke, not as uh, exotic as some of the other people, but it's great to have so many people here. Sri Lanka, yeah, 1 a.m. in the morning. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, we're going to use this. Egypt, Namibia, Hereford, Kent, in it, yeah. Okay, so lots of people. This is awesome. It's great to have so many people, and you're, you're more than welcome. Right, so this is how you work out the extension. Now, the thing is, this is easy because we've got all the numbers from here. So the force is just 98.1. We times that by the original length of 2.00. The Young modulus is 210 times 10 to the 9. So always big values for the Young modulus. And we multiply that by a really small number for the um, area, the surface area. OK, and that means that's going to be equal to, uh, so This gives me an extension of um, about 8.5 or 8.6. Uh, I think here at the moment this is about 8.57, so I'm going to say 8.6 times 10 to the minus 3 metres. And then you've got to think, is that um, a kind of a suitable answer? Well, imagine you've got this wire that we've seen up here. You put 10 kilograms on it. Do you reckon it's going to get about um, nine millimetres longer? And I would say, yeah, that seems about right, because what we have is a piece of steel wire, OK? And you put on a 10 kilogram mass, it's going to get longer by about a centimetre. That seems to me an appropriate answer. If it got 10 centimetres longer, that would be too much. Um, so I think that this is an appropriate answer. Given to two significant figures, um, because we measured the original diameter to two significant figures so two significant figures for the final answer okay uh, and then the final thing is um, the kind of sort of safety precautions this is kind of uh, talked about every so often I would say the two things is um, you need to think about eye protection and the reason for that is in case the wire snaps Okay, so that's the first bit. Uh, the other thing um, you might think about, if the wire did snap, you wouldn't want to have your foot underneath it. So maybe, um, yeah, so like there's a real Joe Linton says, yeah, use safety goggles or glasses, eye protection. Um, and the other thing you need to think about is maybe cushion the floor. Or maybe um, don't have feet under the mass okay because what you wouldn't want and when you tend to use this like really um th this cells apparatus you tend to have quite high masses that you can hang on it and you wouldn't want your feet there okay i mean that just might bruise your toe or something like that uh sand pit for a mass to fall in yep um do glasses count uh nick yes i believe that glasses count some schools use goggles with like kind of full protection but really it's just like often you get like safety glasses which they're not goggles, but they're glasses, and it just stops things going in your eye. Um, okay, don't have feet. No, I don't think that's a good thing. Okay, uh, will I do um, a live stream on, on magnetic fields and capacitance? Of course I will, Luke. Yes, I will be doing lots more Paper 2 stuff over the coming weeks. Uh, somebody asked about, do you need to know the details of Searle's apparatus, or could you just say Searle's apparatus if asked about how to measure young modulus? Josh, that's a really good question. Okay, in the specification... As far as I've read it from like all the main exam boards, they just say uh, you need to be able to describe an experiment to measure the young modulus of a material. OK, now it doesn't it doesn't specify this apparatus because not every school has it. It's quite expensive. You need like a proper hook in the ceiling uh, that's kind of going into a beam to actually hang it on. Now, some schools just have it and some schools don't. So it would be unfair for them to expect you to know about all the details, but it's the kind of thing that you can actually um, be asked a question about because it's introducing, I think if the exam question introduced the apparatus, it's fair game because you still need to know about extension. I mean, everything in this question here, you know, the first question is about data. That's all about data. That's about what equipment to use. That's about how to use the equipment. That's about calculating combined uncertainty. This is a standard question.
question about uh, young modulus. And this one here is just eye protection. That's kind of common sense about a cushion on the floor. So actually, um, I would say that this question, it's not really about Searle's apparatus. It's just Searle's apparatus is used as an, an Searle's apparatus is used as an, an example to actually introduce a question about young modulus and this data analysis. Um, but I would say, if you're not sure, you can read this. So it does say here, um, but basically what you have is different sorts and uh, it's really good because it allows you to measure really small extensions, which is one of the limitations of just doing it on the desk, is that you can add a mass and there might be a vernier caliper kind of thing, or sometimes, um, like this one here has like a, a spirit level bubble and you basically adjust this kind of micrometer screw gauge to get that that uh, bubble back in the middle. So what you're using really is like a micrometer to measure the distance. So you can get to the distance of like, you know, plus or minus uh, 0 0.1 millimeter when you're actually measuring the extension rather than the nearest millimeter that you might measure uh, just horizontally across the table. Are these pilot V-sign pens? Uh, yes, these are pilot V-sign pens. They're great for live streams. I think I found these about nine years ago and I've used them ever since. I've now got a massive collection of them. They don't really come in many colours though. I mean, ideally I'd like an orange one and a yellow one, but at the moment they just basically come in about six colours. Um, how often am I, am I doing these live streams, Nate? Basically, I'm going to be live five days a week. And if you want to find out stuff, head over to A-Level Physics Online. Uh, on the top it says live. If you click on that, you'll see the kind of schedule or schedule, I say schedule, of what's coming up. So you can see I've done one tonight, I'm doing one tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. And basically I'm going to be live most of the time uh, and you can see how this just goes on through May into June. So I'm going to be thoroughly sick of live streams quite soon. Okay, um, Scarface, you still got the GCSE physics equation sheet? Yeah, no way, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, Will I be covering questions on the photoelectric effect at some point? Yes, I'll be doing that, Mads. I'll be trying to do a bit of everything, really. It's it's kind of hard to like please everybody, because I know that people have different aspects of the course that they find most challenging. What I do have, of course, in addition to these live streams, is I can teach you the entire A-level course. At A-level Physics Online, I've got videos about everything from Year 12 and everything from Year 13. So um, if you do have any particular questions that you're not sure about, um, you can basically go to the website uh, and maybe, for example, you're maybe a bit stuck on fields and their consequences. If you're doing AQA, for example, I've got all of these videos down here, or these are like the different pages. So, for example, um, you know, there's deriving the radius of a charged particle. Uh, you can find that video on this page. Uh, and then there's also things about how to drive it. So you can like download the derivation sheet. So if you wanted to derive this equation, uh, you just click on that and it comes up with a video where I've got, um, again, extra stuff you to download so you can look at, I'm sure this kind of looks familiar. If we know the centripetal force and the Lorentz force, we can equate the two, do a bit of rearranging and get it to this format over here. So I do have these derivation sheets for all of A-level physics. Um, let me just sh shut that down. Okay, so there's lots of stuff here for the entire course. Um, basically I've got videos for everything. But of course, go and have a look around uh, and you'll find what you need. Um, right, is there a playlist containing all of these videos? Okay, that's the last thing I'm gonna answer tonight. Uh, right, so let's have a look. I think I've got a, I do have a page at the bottom of the website in the footer that says full video list. So if you click on that, then you can find all the videos in one place. So I've got these extra videos, um, you know, everything here I'm sure kind of makes sense to most people. Uh, gravitational fields, we've got electric and magnetic fields. There's a lot of videos out there. So if there's anything you're not sure about, there are videos uh, and there's kind of some quite specific ones as well. So you can see that on this page, these are some of the videos that I've got. Um, yeah, so there's quite a lot there. Right. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go very soon. Um, 
<laughs> so he says, I heard if you get full marks in the exam, you get your paper sent back with a drawing of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, I, I think that's actually true. I would say that that rumour is 100% true. Um, OK, everybody, I'll see all of you tomorrow night uh, from 8 o'clock for A-level, but obviously from 7.30 for GCSE. Thank you so much for everybody's uh, chat in the stream. It's been great to have all of you here. Uh, and I'll see all of you again very soon. Uh, thanks so much and goodbye. <laughs>